three higher ed authors, 100 plus college and university presidents, dozens of actionable insights for academic leaders. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is now available on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio back with you on another episode here as we um, have passed now 600 episodes. We're fast and furiously marching to 700. If you have taken the time to pick up Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education, the book that I wrote with Kate Colbert, we would appreciate if you'd leave us an Amazon review. You know, I see some of these books get like 100 reviews and I'm going, I know that I have a few friends out there that would review my book. I just have to ask. And so here I am asking, no, begging. I am begging for you to review my book on Amazon. That just helps people find it and learn more about the book and the podcast and so on. And we'll continue to support your work too here on the Ed Up Experience podcast. And we're going to do that today. I'm bringing on a now regular guest co-host. He even has the mug, ladies and gentlemen. He even has the mug. And it arrived at his house in, gosh, where was he? In Fayetteville, New York. Here he is. You probably know him just by the region he lives in now. He is the doctor, Dr. David Lind. He is the director of international programs for the College of Professional Studies at Syracuse University with one of the longest titles in the history of higher education. David, how are you? Oh, I'm so excited to be back, Joe, and I'm really excited to speak to our guest today. Very good, sir. And uh, hopefully when you get home, that mug will be filled with coffee or pencils or erasers or whatever, whatever you want to put in it. But I'm People glad share. you have yeah. it. And I'm glad you came back, David. I wasn't sure. You know, I wasn't sure, you know, once you got the doctorate, if you'd just be like, yeah, I don't care about this podcast anymore, but I'm glad to see you back. You know, I love the cues. I'm thrilled to be back and I, I really can't wait to uh, dig in and, uh, and learn from our, our guest today. Well, he's, uh, we're going to learn a lot because uh, he's, I would say, um, at one of the most innovative uh, in universities in the land, ladies and gentlemen, and he's leading it fast and furious he's even got the letters of the university in his background um, on a shelf that's how serious he is here he is he's jordy highland he is the president and ceo of the american college of education jordy what's going on uh yeah quite quite a lot actually but i'm really excited to uh to have the time with both of you today and, and appreciate it and uh, thanks for uh, noticing the letters of course you know you gotta notice everything in the background i, I noticed <laughs> David's lack of the mug in the background, and I noticed yeah. your letters in the background, you know, so. Okay. Well, if I ever guest host, I will make sure I, I put the mug in a very visible spot. There you go. That's the way we like to do it here. Uh, David knows I'm just messing with him, but um, you said a lot go is going on, Jordy. I mean, that's a good, good question. I mean, what is going on? How are things going at the Mar American College of Education? What are you guys doing? How do you do it? Yeah, so just just at a high level, the American College of Education, I you know internally refer to it as, as ACE. Um, it's uh, so it's a fully online college. Uh, we serve two markets: healthcare and education. Um, it was founded 20 years ago, um, fully online, uh, founded by teachers for teachers. Um, we've been growing uh, quickly, so we're at about nine ninety five hundred students at this point. Uh, we have thirty five thousand alum. Um, and we're working with adult learners who are employed, um, who want to acquire new skills and increase their, their earnings. Um, we're really focused on uh, student outcomes. We've got about 80% 80, 80 uh, graduation rate. Um, and we're excited the uh, last couple of months we received the number two online ranking by, by Newsweek. Um, so I think that's helped raise, raise our profile. I think we've been kind of operating somewhat un under the radar. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're focused on um, the markets where there are huge human capital challenges. So I think that that leads to some of the, um, uh, the urgency around the work that, that we do. Um, you know, we're supporting healthcare and education. There's huge uh, nursing shortages, teacher shortages. Um, so we're really trying to provide high quality training that impacts uh, patient and learner outcomes um, ultimately. And uh, we've got the focus on being affordable flexible and uh, high quality. Um, I think what's important about ACE to, to point out up front, there was a founding decision not to um, take, even though we're regionally accredited by the Higher Learning Commission, not to take Title IV funding um, and to really focus on the student ROI. And so that's allowed us to really uh, keep our, our, our costs down. Um, and then increasingly we've been um, 
also focused on credit for prior learning and uh, recognizing pri prior work to further bring the cost down. Um, we haven't raised tuition in over seven years, and I think our net costs have been going down given the approach to credit for prior learning and the 1.5 million in scholarships that we offer every year. Uh, so our bachelors are around, uh, you know, are under 10K, uh, MBAs under, under 10K, and uh, EDDs under 24K. And 85% um, of our, our graduates uh, or students graduate uh, pay as they go with, with no debt. So in the larger context of higher ed, where there's $1.6 trillion of uh, outstanding Title IV loans, uh, we, we feel like we're in a very differentiated position. So that was a long preamble, but that's that's kind of ace and and what's why we're we're busy at the moment. Well, you scrambled brains when you said no Title Four. Are you serious? Because, right, that's the way we do things in higher education. You got to have Title Four funding if you want to have students, but that's not the case at Ace, right? Why why is the model different? Why are students interested in a pay, it's a pay as you go? You mentioned it's kind of a pay as you go yeah. model. Why is that a value proposition for these working learners? Well, I think um, I, I think there's been uh, huge uh, tuition inflation generally in in higher ed, and and ACE has um, had a real focus on um, uh, the cost of delivery, and then providing the tuition based on the the cost of, of delivery. And being fully online um, doesn't have to you know have large campuses, and uh, we're not a a research institution. We have a lot of efficacy around our teaching and learning, but we're not a, a research institution. Um, so there's a number of things that allow us to keep our, our costs down. And so I think that that provides an affordable option for, for working adults combined with the, the flexibility of, of being fully online. And um, with that, uh, those lower costs, it just provides the opportunity to work, be able to afford to pay uh, on a term to term basis, or, um, you know, there, there is access to private loans. And, and then in addition, that, that as I mentioned, that access with that ability to provide credit for prior learning can further bring the cost down. So I think it's um, it's not really in the, the dialogue. As I understand the market, there's there's not a lot of other schools that are uh, have access to Title IV that don't um, that don't provide that um, that opportunity uh, to students. But I think it it provides a context for administrating a school where there has to be a lot of focus on not only value. Um, because the students are paying as, you know, they they have the decision stop at, at any time. They're, they're paying as they go. But also uh, that focus on keeping the, the cost down. And it is very much a, a viable option. That being said, I think it, I mean, it's a lot easier for a school to do it that starts fully online and starts sooner rather than later. I think it's uh, it would be a difficult transition for traditional schools that have, you know, huge campuses and, and infrastructure and uh, other other legacy processes. Nailed it. I want to just before I pass it to David, I want to. Uh, Was that Joe Pesci? No, no, that wasn't. I'm saving my Joe Pesci stuff for, oh, okay. later, uh, for for when David goes because I, you know, sometimes when I get new stuff, it's hard to time it right. So I gotta got to mess it. up with, yes. with David. I'll mess up with him. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, you you talk about this. Um, uh, the, the you you said it. There is a value to students to pay as you go, but you have to be really on top of student service because if it's not there, I'm not going to pay. Uh, because I'm not getting something that I want or expect. And so there has to be, to, to have the student progress, they have to be satisfied, right? Yeah. So there's a per, per particular satisfaction that has to be maintained. Not that you don't have to do that in a traditional, mo traditional model with Title IV, but a lot of times you can be packaged in tit with Title IV over a long period of time, and now I'm going and you know I've got money and I'm continuing. But if it's term to term, moment to moment, there is a transaction so to speak, taking place. For sure. Talk yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah. So I, th I think the, um, you know, there, there has to be a, a, and there has to be this across higher ed, but, um, you know, there has to be a real focus on the, the faculty and student relationships and the, the, the caring involved um, and also the student support services um, to be able to provide not only, you know, value added teaching, but also support from a student uh, service perspective. Um, you know, we're, we're fortunate in the sense that we, we have been getting very strong student outcomes with 85% graduation rate, 94% um, student satisfaction overall, and then 90% employer satisfaction. So I think there's an, there's, uh, there's an important piece to this where there's the, you know, the, 
the service perspective. Um, but I think there's also alignment with employers, which is really important and align alignment to the job market. So our, our faculty members are, um, are, are from industry, they're practitioners. Um, you know, in the education school, uh, many of our, ad some of our adjuncts are, are superintendents, for example. Um, so not only, and our faculty are working closely um, with our internal curriculum team on the, the curriculum development processes. And then we have a, a tight connection with industry through our advisory boards in terms of um, updating and keeping it, keeping it alive and, and relevant. Um, but I think there has to be that strong connection between, especially for adult learners that, you know, have a full full-time job, family commitments, a lot of other commitments um, to uh, making it relevant and, and engaging and um, really arming them or equipping them with what they need to succeed on the job and to, to really uh, move ahead in, in their careers. And um, so I think that's, that's an important piece from a, a student perspective. And um, I should just mention that, um, you know, more and more we're seeing the importance of building upon those relationships with business to further become a solution provider to school districts and, and hospitals um, because the human capital shortages are so severe. Um, flexible and nimble higher ed and education industries can really um, provide value added support there. And so that's another important benefit of um, uh, not only to support the students, but also to, um, to help be more relevant in uh, providing those connections, which can help graduates and help help students uh, overall get ahead in their careers and really facilitate career pathways. Um, so that's that's the lens that more and more we're looking at when we're looking at how our programs map together, how our curriculum um, uh, teaches um, and what it's focused on. Does it sort of provide a cohesive student experience that leads to career progression? Um, and ultimately, um, you know, better, better uh, long-term career outcomes. I like your style, dude. David Lind. Yeah, so um, Jordy, one of the criticisms of higher education is that it tends to favor experience over youth when it comes to hiring decisions for their college presidents. You know, your typical college president may be in their 60s and 70s, and the typical student body will be in, you know, their late teens, early 20s. And you're yeah. in an position because you're much closer in age to your actual students and not wanting to throw any shade on some of your fellow college presidents. I think it's fair to say you're on the younger end of the spectrum when it comes to college presidents um, arriving on the scene with, with fresh ideas. So I was wondering if you could explain um, what the pathway to the presidency was like for you, what the hiring process was like at ACE. Please answer the question. Uh, sure. Um, so in terms of uh, just the, the hiring process, um, I, I think there's a, um, a really uh, talented board um, at, at ACE and there's a range of experiences across healthcare and, and education and um, a, a number of uh, different relevant uh, industries. And so it was a very um, extensive process. Um, there, were, there were a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, virtual and in-person meetings Reported interviews, um, so I sort of really went through um, a rigorous process, and uh, felt very fortunate to uh, to be provided with with the opportunity. Um, I think it's yeah certainly fair to say that uh, uh, I am on the younger end for for a college president, um, have a non traditional background, um, but ACE is a non traditional school, and and we're trying to have an impact in a non traditional way. So I think. Uh, from my perspective, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I was fortunate that the decision makers at, at uh, ACE who hired me uh, felt the same way. Live in the now. I was hoping I would get, uh, you know, the uh, Home Alone version of, of Joe Pesci and not the Goodfellas one, because that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a little know. scary at times. <laughs> but word on the street, talking about the street, is that uh, Jordy, now more than ever, you know, leading a higher education institution is is complicated. Right? It's a difficult yeah. complicated task. So, is it any more or less difficult leading a private online institution as opposed to a traditional residential institution? So, I think it's different. Um, again, I, I come from a non traditional background. I've been in online education for for quite some some time, and um, don't don't come from a traditional uh, bricks and mortar uh, background. Um, so, take that you know. Take that with a, a grain of salt, but I think that uh, without having a campus, um, 
that you you're able to focus in in a lot of ways. Um, you don't have the uh, the in in person in person issues, and you don't have a huge infrastructure of of buildings. Um, but I think um, I think with that comes an ability to uh, to be more nimble and to to adapt. But that comes with complications as well, right? And so what you know what we're really trying to do to um, start uh, continue to build upon being a solution provider for school districts and hospitals and going into those institutions and helping them on, like looking at their professional development as you're providing credit for prior learning uh, to learners from from their institutions and then mapping our programs to their career pathways um, and showing value um, that's that's not easy either it's just so I think it's just it's different and we're, we're trying to be different and, and to adapt in a way that makes sense and as an executive team at ACE, um, it's it's really important to set a set a vision and to to really communicate that to the to the team and to the partners. Um, so I I don't think it's not complicated, but I think it's uh, it's it would be different if you had um, from the issues probably if you brought a uh, uh, president from a traditional school in here tomorrow and asked what what his or her priorities were. You know that the world of higher education is experiencing evolutions and revolutions. You want to be part of the progress. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education with insights from more than 100 college and university presidents will show you how. Get your copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education now on Amazon right away. We think you're going to love it. It's amazing. You already talk about t talk about leadership for us a minute, because you have a, a decentralized workplace, right? There's no building. Yeah. You're you're all online. You're leading um, the institution virtually, right? Um, what does that look like for you? If you could think of maybe one or two things you do as a leader to foster relationships, because we all do something online. You know, we're some of us are on teams. Some of us have just you know decentralized workforces we have some, like for example i'll use myself as an example yeah i've got some people on on staff here i've got a team that is not and sometimes sometimes and of course i'm not talking about myself but yeah. leaders can do an out of sight out of mind thing sometimes when you have everybody in front of you and then you have this workforce that's not here it's like oh pull it pull everybody together real fast oh shoot we forgot to pull in so and so so that's hard um, but when you have an entire workforce that is uh, working remotely, you have to be For very sure. intentional about who you're inviting and why, what involvement you have and why. What are some leadership tips you can give us for managing a remote workforce? Sure. Um, so I, I think what, what you just said uh, is, is really important about being intentional about who you, who, who you bring in, first of all. I mean, I, I think um, we're, we're fortunate at, at uh, ACE, we have a really mission driven team and um, people are very uh, engaged because they they believe in in, in the mission. Um, but I think that that it takes intentionality to, to foster that for sure. Um, so I think um, setting a vision is really important, um, setting uh, uh, goals and uh, really having a priority on, on accountability is important, especially in a in a uh, online uh, uh, context. Um, and then uh, just making sure you've got you've got the the feedback loops and you're you're listening, um, and then taking action upon what you hear from from staff, and that of course is important for for students as well. Um, so I mean those are kind of the some of the high level mechanisms. But I think at the end of the day, it's uh, higher ed is a is a people business, and your you know the, your ability to to innovate really depends on on your people. And so just, um, you know, taking the time to make sure the relationships are, are strong and making sure that there's a context where you're, you're managed, you have the right balance between accountability with, with caring and with, um, with making sure that you, you understand the challenges of, of the team and you're taking the time um, to, to, to foster them, not only from a professional, but a, a personal perspective. Which it does take some real intentionality to do that. Because I think yeah. even in person, we, I do it sometimes. It's like Monday morning and somebody comes in and I'm like, hey, 
how did the numbers go over the weekend? And I go, okay, wait a minute, let me step back. How was your weekend? Tell me about yes. your family. What'd yes. you do? What did you? Yes. Right. Because, because it's important to do that. And I think as leaders, we, we came off a of family weekend and we just want to jump right into work. And we have to remember that it's important to foster those relationships online. Sometimes working remotely, it's even harder to do that because the, you know, it's like, everybody's kind of jumping right in. So you really have to front load or back load your meetings with a couple of minutes to, to ask those personal questions to create those, the trust, right? Especially yeah. as a new leader coming into an institution as president CEO, everybody's going, oh, wow, now I've got this person who's over the entire university who I've got to get to know. And yeah. it creates that little bit of uncertainty and so on. And only you can put that at ease, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I think um, just in terms of a, a team, culture perspective, it's also important to, um, if, if, you, if you value this, um, to, to make sure it's, um, it's highlighted to folks that, you know, you, the importance of open inquiry, the, the importance of, you know, having open, open debates and um, valuing different uh, viewpoints and also perspectives from, um, from or different perspectives. Um, and, and at the end of the day, um, having an inclusive team uh, approach, uh, I think is, is really important. And um, we, we've actually been, um, we've been uh, fortunate at, at ACE, we've been able to win a, you know, the top, top workplace um, uh, designation the last two years in a row. So I, I think that that really helps raise our profile, but also helps attract, um, attract uh, folks to us as well. Um, and then uh, we've gone through the, I don't know, uh, the, the B Corp designation through B Labs. Um, and so we've it's basically a separate accreditation process where they look at you from a social impact perspective, environmental impact, uh, transparency and accountability. Um, and then they give you a, a, a number and then you can build upon it each year. But I think that's that's important to um, for us anyway, in terms of building team culture as well, because it's a great, um, uh, I guess, process for us all to rally behind. There's you know community service that's required and, and other actions, but I think it helps remind people that um, we're here to here to make a difference and that there's external acknowledgement of that. Um, and then, you know, I, in, in my opinion, I try to, you know, tie as much as possible our core operations to that, you know, what we try, what, what we're trying to do in education and healthcare is make an impact and on the human capital shortages. I think that's really tied um, to what the, the spirit behind the B Corps designation as well. So that the core of what we do is is impacting that, and I think um, I think that's uh, that that's important um, to have a connection to what you're doing to uh, what matters to your, to your staff. And if you're able to, uh, you know, recruit a mission driven staff, it's important to have a, a mission driven potential impact. It's all part of the plan, David. He's on mute, ladies and gentlemen. He's on mute, and I had I had something ready for him too, and I didn't. I, I it's not. It's definitely not ready. Oh, you can interrupt with your sound effects any any. Oh, here it is. Hey, I'm doing a favor here, you know. You know, come on, you can't mess up. I'm getting nervous now. <laughs> He's gonna pull out a bloody bat any second. No. <laughs> uh, so the there's something called the American College President Study, Jordy, which is put out by the American Council on Education, which also uses yes. the ACE. Yeah. And they need to be that's like, the other ace. Yes. Yeah. I, I actually was speaking to someone from the other ace at an accreditor conference the other week. And uh, I think we we each get a lot of people assuming we're from the other ace. Yeah, they actually they so they produce like this survey every year that um, where they get survey, they get data from 1500 college presidents and they ask them all kinds of questions. And um, one of them is about how they spend their time. Um, and despite the fact that most of them would like to spend more time closer to students and faculty, where they actually spend their time is, is in budget and fundraising meetings. Um, so I'm wondering, yeah, how does that play out for you, particularly with, you know, um, an online distributed kind of student population? Do you get to have any time in front of your students? Um, is there any time during the year where you have, you know, residences, like for the EDD cohorts, or how does that work? Yeah, well, so I um, uh, certainly try to uh, spend time with with uh, a variety of, of staff, and um, uh, you know, I I don't have to spend time in fundraising meetings, for for example. Um, so I think uh, 
you know, there, I can allocate my time differently. Um, you know, I, I, I do try to have, have connections with um, the, the students when, when I can. Of course, it's in an online um, uh, uh, mechanism at, at this point, but, you know, we have com a graduation coming up, so I'll be able to spend time with a lot of them. We also have graduate events, so I'm able to, I was in one in Orlando a few weeks ago and, and spent time with uh, students and, and graduates there. So there are those uh, in-person connections as well. Um, but I, I would say uh, I spend a lot of my time uh, with with staff around executing upon uh, upon the strategy and uh, trying to, trying to support them um, and uh, do spend time with uh, with partners um, and, and potential partners and um, uh, that that is a uh, important part of, uh, of of my role at this point. I'm going to ask a follow up if 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 uh, my co-host sure. allows me. Um, so this is become. May I do the thinking, please? <laughs> Go ahead. That's, I guess thanks. So. thanks. Oh, that's that's a Joe too. Joe Pesci and Joe Salustio now yeah, working working it hard here They're in league with each other. So um, this has become kind of an ed up question that I ask uh, college presidents just to um, get them get the creative juices flowing. Sure. Uh, the line between technology of the future and technology of, of the present is becoming somewhat blurred, especially with the technologies that are out now, like chat GPT, um, which makes the question I'm about to ask less hypothetical and actually more real. Yeah. So what if you could borrow a piece of technology from the future, bring it into the present, you know, like back to the future, uh, to solve <clears throat> some sort of communication problem with one of your key stakeholder groups, whether it be the students or faculty or staff or your community partners or your industry partners, what would that technology be and how would it help you solve the communication problem? And you could take your time. Yeah, no, I mean, what, what jumps to mind uh, initially for me is just the, you know, there, there have been a bit in, um, advancements in simulation software and, and virtual reality, but I don't think it's uh, it's it's where it's going to be, and I think um, I think that's uh, you know being able to have really impactful learning experiences through the uh, the LMS lever you know like if you look at video games versus uh, learning experiences in the LMS there, there's there's a ways ways to go and I think um, I think that's technology that's really going to benefit both both the learner the engagement of the learner um, and um, the ability to um, to assess the, uh, the the learning that happens, um, and will further close the gap with uh, the needs of um, of industry. Um, so that that's what jumps to mind for me. But um, to your point, I mean, we are going through a, a phase of huge, uh, rapid change, uh, especially with with Chat GPT, and so that's something that we're uh, you know we're we're watching closely, and we're um, you know working with our our faculty and uh, and. Uh, uh, stakeholders in terms of how we we respond to it, but I think that that technology is not going away, and we need to um, to uh, em embrace it in a way that, uh, that 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 works for for us and our ultimately our, our students who, who we're serving. Yep, thank you. And back over to you, Joe. What do you think, Jordy, about uh, change? Right, um, because and the reason I ask is because there is a lot of change. Um, yeah. But if you're in an institution. And you're growing, you know, just yesterday, university closes Cardinal Stritch in Wisconsin announced closure yesterday. So if you know the news, when you hear this episode, you'll know what yesterday was, um, because I've just dated this episode, which is fine. But, you know, this is happening often where schools are closing. And typically the reason is didn't change. We fear change. So, you know, higher ed typically doesn't move that fast and we're seeing it happen. And there are institutions that are absolutely moving fast, but some that just didn't move fast enough. Um, and they're not insulated enough through endowment or multi-year operational budgets and so on. How do you keep your team fresh and moving? You know, how do you keep them aware and awake and accepting of the change that needs to be adopted without holding on to traditional models? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think we're fortunate in the sense that, so that we are built from the ground up on online. So again, we don't have some of the, the legacy yep. processes and, and infrastructure. Um, but I think to, to manage change, there's a couple of things to, to really uh, keep in mind. 
Um, the, the first is, is the, the vision and, and connecting the change to a larger um, uh, goal. And um, I think in the, in the current context, what, you know, what we're really focused on, it always starts with the student. And really our founding principle was around student ROI and um, how, to, uh, how to have a school that really helps, um, helps uh, learners uh, progress through, through their, their careers without you know, layering on federal student, student debt. And so I think that um, there's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a pull from the market for, for that change, right? Like we're operating in industries where there's huge human capital shortages. We have high quality, um, affordable programs that can help with um, you know, recruiting, retaining, upskilling, creating leadership pipelines uh, within, within those industries. Um, and so uh, a big part of the change is making sure that it's all connected in terms of the vision, but there's also, um, there's, a, there's a clear plan that needs to be followed and uh, you, don't, you don't try to, you can't do every, everything at once. You've got to manage the change with the resources you have and to make sure that there's the proper resources set aside to be able to do it properly. And, and I think that's where a lot of institutions have challenges with, with change. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's, there's an underestimation in terms of the time and the resource commitment to making real change. Um, and then, uh, you know, a, a lack of not the appropriate resources put to enabling, enabling the, the change. Um, so those are the, you know, the big things that come to mind. 100%. David, it looks like you'd like to jump in and interrupt me. You, you noticed. Would that be accurate? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so, Jordy, one of the advantages to fully online universities is, is kind of the level playing field for the students, right? From their perspective, they're having the same experience as their classmates, regardless of where they happen to be geographically or even demographically. So, um, and, you know, you explained to us earlier the, the model, the pay, pay as you go model, the you know, incredibly low tuition rates. Um, how do your demographics reflect this uh, level playing field? And and um, do you have students from all over the US and all over the world? As someone who works with international students, I was also curious about that. Yeah, for sure. I, so uh, we're HLC accredited. Um, so we're able to operate all, all over the world. So High Learning Commission. Uh, we have uh, NC Sarah, um, which is a state reciprocity agreement. So we operate in all all fifty states, and um, we offer um, bachelor completers through EDD in in education um, and in in healthcare, um, RN to BSN, all all the way up through through EDD as well. So we do have a range of of programs um, that uh, different types of learners uh, learn on. We don't market proactively internationally at, at, the, at this point. Uh, we're focused nationally, but we have a significant number of international learners that, that come, come to us. And um, we also have uh, folks that move to the U.S. that, that want to, um, you know, uh, get the certifications to, to get ahead of in, in, their, in their careers. Um, so, you know, you, you asked about talking to, to students, and I'll give you a Example of a student I was, I was speaking to the other uh, the other day, a, a woman named Marissa Windmill. Uh, she was born in the Philippines, uh, taught there for ten years, and, and you know communicated that it was it was a struggle. She moved to the U.S., um, taught for twelve years, became certified, um, and then heard about ACE and the affordability and the quality experience. She took a master's with us while she was teaching full time, while she had young kids, while she had a a busy husband and was caring for a mother who was diagnosed with cancer. Um, she was able to successfully complete and now she's come back to, to do an EDD with us. Um, she's got an important role in the Kent School District. Um, she's working with refugee organizations and ELL and really uh, you know thriving as a community builder. So that's an example of, of a student that, that comes to us where our flexibility and affordability really helps facilitate um, career and, and, and life progression. Epic, epic, epic. Such a good story. I love, I love good student stories. And we, sometimes I think we get wrapped up in administration as administrators. We, we have to take time to go, 
it's not just this one student, it's just this one student example of many other students that we serve. Yeah, and we get that sure. gets lost sometimes, I think. We we do such good work and yeah, you have to manage, David, to your point, budget and finances and ingoing and outgoing expenses, but it's but it's like at the end of the day, if you can change that life, that's what it's all about. And we have to remind our teams of that um, yes. for sure, right? Yes. Jordy, how do you what do you do? Is there any 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 secret to this? Do you like talk about a student meeting or any kind of strategy around remembering the work and the out the outcomes? Well, I think uh, I think first of all, when you when you make important decisions as, as a team, you have to come back and remind people: Is this decision in the best interest of the student? And have that be the the decision, the guiding decision point. Um, but then I think um, working with um, you know the, the marketing team and, and collecting um, stories. And, and making sure that, that folks are reminded of those stories are, it, it, it's really important. Um, and um, bringing it back to they're the reason why why we're here and their um, their perspective is so important. So another, I think, important reminder, maybe it's, it's um, less inspirational, but I think really important to focus on is getting the student feedback on an ongoing basis and then using it and having right. structured project plans around their feedback um, is is really valuable clearly to uh, efforts to continue to improve but I think it also highlights to staff and you know continues to reinforce in their mind why they're here and and what's important um, and um, I, I think uh, especially with the, the faculty and the student services roles there's always uh, room for improving and training in terms of being able to to make that connection with students and to inspire students and to sh ultimately show that that you care for students and um, so being able to to take uh, administrative burden off of folks that are supporting students is is important as well and having the proper oversight as well and just making sure that they're using the if they're instructor the latest uh, online approaches that that can enable uh, enable them to have those those connections. I have to ask you this because this is one, I think such an important topic in our day and age right now, and that is teachers, right? Being a teacher, wanting to be a teacher, um, and it's your university is a t a teachers building it for teachers, right? It was for teachers built yes. by teachers. Yeah. Um, you do hear, does anybody want to be a teacher anymore? Can you give us a glimpse into what the demand looks like for for teachers in general, education programs in general? and what you see into the future for these programs? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I mean, so first of all, I'll, I'll start with um, with our with our college and teachers and recruiting teachers. There's huge interest in teaching roles at online schools like ours, so it's it's interesting. Um, but I, I think um, I think in the in the K twelve market, um, you know, there are human capital shortages, and yes. at the root of them are in a, you know challenges with recruiting teachers. And retaining teachers, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of the studies which indicate that you know there's shortages and also lots of lots of uh, teachers that are considering uh, leave, leaving the field. Yikes! Um, and so I think um, you know having strong public school systems is incredibly important to our communities, but also to our democracy. And I mean, there's a huge importance for um, acknowledging and having a having a society where teachers are are valued. And where people want to want to go into teaching. So um, obviously, there's there's lots of reasons that that go into the, the shortages and, and the challenges. Um, ways that we we think we can impact it in a positive way is helping to partner with school districts to um, create career pathways, affordable career pathways, and uh, pipelines towards towards leadership opportunities. Uh, you know, an example of a um, uh, a big opportunity is um, upscaling paraprofessionals or teachers assistants that in uh, you know there's there's a lot of teachers assistants that are in roles where if they went to a traditional school that the cost would be um, you know they'd spend the rest of their careers paying off the the tuition um, you know we're, we're able to provide a, um, a, a cost-effective path for them with our bachelor completer and then the hope is you know have them continue on and uh, create pathways towards uh, leadership roles, and um, there's there's obviously an equity component to to that as well. And so, 
um, that's the, the type of solution that, that really excites us. Um, and um, I think why there's a, a large focus on um, really uh, raising the profile of, of ACE because we think we can have greater impact. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I mentioned, I touched on this earlier, but also, you know, a lot of paraprofessionals, a lot of folks in healthcare, uh, they have a lot of experience. They have a lot of courses they've taken. And so working with school districts or working work with hospitals to look at what their professional development is and then potentially um, providing credit towards our degrees for that professional development can also further bring down the, the cost and, and create access. Um, so I think to your question, one, one piece of it is um, in terms of the shortages, not only teaching, but also in healthcare, is the, the perception about career pathways and, um, and the ability to get on a career ladder and then increase earnings. And so that's what we're passionate about helping to, to facilitate. Um, but there's lots of other um, things going on. We live in a complicated time. And um, you know, we're, we're focused on the areas that we believe we can impact. Love it. Well, David, uh, you know, I'd like to close out every episode with the same two questions to every guest. But before I do, I want to see if you have any other questions for Mr. Jordy here. Yeah. So, so Jordy, you went through your famous first 100 days, right? You're about six or seven months in. Yeah. Um, yes. How does it feel? Um, do you feel better than you expected? Uh, was it Cheers. Yeah, which parts yeah. Were, were easier or more difficult than you expected? Yeah, well, um, so I, I, I mentioned this early in the interview when he asked about the recruiting process. It was a really extensive recruiting process. And so I felt very thankful that what I learned in the uh, recruiting process was the case. So there weren't a lot, you know, there weren't big surprises uh, when I when I started working. And so that was um that was great. And then um, you know, I, I love the people, I love the team. One of the things I always heard about and saw during the recruitment process was just, it, it's such a great group of, of people. And so that's been really, really energizing. And then we've really been focused on uh, the evolution. And I, and I find that very mo motivating. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a pull from the market for what we're trying to do. And so that's, uh, that's energizing the opportunity to, um, to have an impact that, that really matters. So I'm really energized. That's great to hear. Back over to you, Joe. Well, David, do you want to, do you, I, I mean, since you're my expert co-host, do you want to close out the episode? Do you remember, do you know my sure. questions? Yeah. So this is an Are opportunity. Are you sure? <laughs> Let's see I just want to know, but, but, by the way, you mentioned Goodfellas Joe Pesci and you mentioned Home Alone Joe Pesci. What you didn't mention was the greatest Joe Pesci of all time, which was My Cousin Visit. My Cousin Visit. Are good you one. sure? Um, <laughs> I, just just a side note, but my my son loves Home Alone, so I've probably seen Home Alone like fifty times at this point. I always want to watch new movies, but he always just wants to watch Home Alone. Okay. Yes, I know the feeling of I, I know the feeling. I've seen Encanto, uh, forty seven okay. times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jordi, I'm sure there are questions that you maybe were expecting us to ask but didn't. So what if if the, what question would you like us to have asked that we did not? Um, wonder what question uh, that I'd like you to have asked. Um, or what do you want to say about ACE that we didn't say? Or anything anything that you want to say that you think needs to be said? How about that? Yeah. Now's your chance to uh, get on the soapbox and shout out from the rooftops all the good things about ACE. Oh, yeah, well, okay. So I, I think um, in terms of, you know, we, we touched on the challenges in, in high ed. But I think a interesting question, and, and I think this, this will relate to ACE, is why does, why do student debt levels, Title IV debt, why does it keep rising? Right, there, there's a lot of debate about, do we forgive it? Uh, do we, you know, how, how do we, um, how do we address the, the current uh, uh, situation? But why is there not more debate around, um, around how, how do we, how do we take away some of the, the need for it? How do, how do we optimize? How do we, how do we reduce the inflation? I mean, uh, higher ed inflation, tu tuition inflation has risen higher than inflation, right? In the last, uh, I believe the last 10 years. And, and we, there's all sorts of concerns around inflation, 
but uh, high rent inflation is is e even higher. So that's an interesting question. And um, I guess if, if you would ask it, I, I I think I think there needs uh, I, my response would be I, I think there needs to be more debate around the root causes. Um, I think there needs to be more alignment in terms of how we assess higher ed institutions. Um, I don't think there's there's a great consensus for what we should all look at when we're assessing the efficacy and um, of higher ed. And I think more of a focus on you know the the ROI or the the um, the outcomes for for the for the student um, and and more examples like ACE that that are in the in the dialogue about um, about student debt. Love it. All right, David. Um, I don't. I don't the really last know. one. <laughs> so yeah, you you touched on an interesting point there because um, at, at Joe mentioned in a previous episode um, in which he interviewed uh, the person in charge of the Google search that a gut punch for higher ed is that some people leave you know get their bachelor's degree or even master's degree and then they they go to a place like Google to get a cert because what does that say about what we're doing as higher education leaders, right? Yeah. I'm going to go out on the limb and guess that your population doesn't have that problem, <laughs> that the nurse, you know, the, the nurses are finding work, the educators are finding work, the EDD graduates are well, finding work. Well, okay, so that's a, that's a really interesting question, and, and we do have uh, micro-credentials and certifications, and we, we also, as I mentioned, we provide credit for, for prior learning for shorter learning experiences, and we certainly want to evolve in this area. Um, yeah, I mean, when students, uh, they're, they're, there's typically not a challenge for a teacher or a, a nurse to find a job in those those fields. The challenge is keeping them in those fields. And so certifications, um, shorter learning experiences are um, great uh, opportunities to help to retain staff in those fields, but also help them build their skills um, especially hospitals are having facing huge technical technological and, and business model changes and, and uh, certifications can really help with with upskilling um, but also uh, le leadership challenges as, as well in terms of critical mass at the leadership level so having a, a pathway to those opportunities through shorter learning experiences is something that that's um, you know we're really focused on with with our with our partners not only providing um, the 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 credit for other um, learning, learning experiences from other, uh, from either from their in-house institution or from our partners, but also our, we have an ability to break out our content to help facilitate uh, smaller ex learning experiences that, that can um, ladder up into, into our programs. Um, so I think, I think that, that uh, my, my opinion is that that trend towards certifications and, and uh, shorter credentials is a really important one that is um, really relevant to to building, uh, strengthening those human capital um, challenges. Jordi, um, anything in a minute or less that you want to add for what you see in the future for higher education? Uh, so higher education, generally, I, I think um, you know I was just at a accreditation conference and there, there were um, you know a lot of discussions about the right the changing regulatory landscape it, it does um, seem like there's a lot of um, change that's potentially in the works for schools that do accept uh, title IV funding and so it'd be interesting to see what actually happens and and how it uh, how it all plays out my hope for higher education is that uh, as I mentioned earlier there, there's a I, I believe there's a lack of consensus on how to properly assess higher ed institutions across the spectrum. I hope that that, that, um, that, is, that is worked on. And I hope as an industry, we're able to uh, continue to, to adapt and, and ultimately serve the, the consumer because consumer tastes are changing and uh, there's a lot of technological change and um, we're really gonna have to adapt quickly to continue to, be, uh, to stay, stay as relevant as we can. Well, there you have it, everyone. My uh, amazing guest co-host, he's a pro now. He, you know, there are only about seven mistakes in this episode, down from nine <laughs> in the last episode. That's okay. There he is, Dr. David Lynn. He's the Director of International Programs oh, for the College of Professional Studies at Syracuse University. David, you know I love you, and I'm glad you got the mug. 
Uh, it's always fun to have you here because, you know, I get to take more focus on myself, right? I'm going to actually take my mug to future Zoom meetings and do some product placement for Ed Apple. Wow. <laughs> God, you're just like my favorite person ever, David. No, honestly, and you know how much uh, I love the work that you're doing. I appreciate you having you here. Um, and uh, just so you know, Jordy, David picked out this episode. I said, hey, David, pick one of these. Who are you interested in talking to? And he well, said, I want to well, talk I'm, with Jordy. Thank you very much, David. It, it, it is awesome to put together these types of relationships uh, with people. And uh, boy, we appreciate the work you're doing, Jordy. There he is, ladies and gents. He's Jordy Heinlein. He is president and CEO of the American College of Education. Jordy, did you have a good time on the podcast today? Yeah, this was this was fantastic. I, I really appreciate you having me on, but also just the, the dialogue. It was It was great. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. It's time to level up. The beginning of a new era in higher education begins with you. Order your copy of Commencement. The beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert, Dr. Joseph Lucille, with contributions by Elvin Freitas. It's higher education's must read book of 2022. Discover how you can seize the moment to change higher education forever commencement at the beginning of a new era in higher education now available on amazon for bulk orders contact kate joe or elvin 